I'll formally all wait, welcome you along. My name is Steve Douglas. You know, I'm the ch executive chairman of SMATS Group and, and the managing director of ATS. And, and uh, well, this is my 12th budget seminar. So I've been doing this now for 12 years. And we take this, obviously, all around the world and, and share it with everyone else. But you always get to be the first you know, um, you know, off the rank. And hopefully it will be a good one. And as usual, we're going to get stuck into it. There's lots to do tonight. And We'll start with the important element of why are they doing it? What's the key agenda? What is the motivation? And, and this year, you know, it's been a tough year for the government. They only just snuck in the election, you know, by the skin of their teeth. You know, they've still got an unbalanced Senate. Last year's budget, the only thing that I really wished for as we were moving into a double dissolution election was that one party would win the election and win both houses of parliament. That was my only wish. I didn't really care if it was Liberal or Labor but I wanted one party to win. Well, one party won, but it didn't get both houses. And we had the rebirth of Pauline Hanson and the minorities in the Senate, which was very strange. We lost the, the, uh, the, the crew with Palmer, but we picked up the other alternative with, with Hanson. So it's an odd you know, situation. So it's been an interesting few months for the government, and they've had to learn some things. And the first thing is they've had to come to a realisation that you can't keep doing the same thing and not wonder why you keep getting the same results. They've been banging their head against the door of the Senate trying to pass legislation with no success and they banged it so much their brains fell out and we have what we call these zombie you know, um, savings that they were trying to get through for the last few years and could not get through. And finally they realised that, hey, let's just throw them out the window. So this budget was a, a massive realisation that there's no point just pushing, pushing the same message. So they've had to t turn around and come back at, from a different direction and they've been more conciliatory and more friendly and that's been important. Choice is the key element. They're glad that they got chosen as the ruling party last election, but they want to make sure that everyone thinks that they made the right choice, because believe you me, Australians aren't sure. They're definitely not sure that they made the right choice last August. And they're questioning it, and the popularity is not high. So they're trying to reinforce the fact that, hey, you did make the right choice, and we will make the right choices for you, choices that will grow Australia and be better. They're also trying to show that they're fair. They've still got this overhang from the 2014 budget that was very, very hard. I'm on the record, I actually like the 2014 budget, but that's because I'm an accountant. It was necessary from a, fi a financial point of view to do those things, but everybody didn't like it and it cost Abbott his job, basically. I think hockey's now living it up with, uh, with uh, you know, the President there of the United States. But you know, they've tried to come full circle and now be very caring, and I think they've achieved that in this budget. And security is obviously a key element on everyone's mind. You know, they've put a lot of money in this budget to make sure people aren't just emotionally secure, but they're financially and, and uh, you know, of course, from a, a national security point of view, a lot of money going in here to tidy things up. And they're identifying that there's more opportunity down the line and we've got to get ready. So there's an enormous amount of reinvestment and new investment into infrastructure. And that's been a constant theme over the last few years and has been expanded upon drastically in this budget. In terms of uh, trust, they want to make you know that they know what they're doing and they're trying to use this budget as the launch pad to reinvent themselves and to reboot themselves in the mind of the electorate. And I think they're going to go a long way with that. In terms of my favourite saying of the budget, the right choices. The choices is what this budget was all about. We've made good choices, you've made a good choice. We will continue to make good choices. Keep choosing us. That really is the subliminal message coming through this, and it's very powerful. Let's have a look at the numbers. And for the first time in a long time, I can tell you that they almost achieved their budget. If we look at the, the figures there, last year the budget deficit was expected to be $37.1 and if you look at the 2016-17 estimate, it actually came in at 37.6. So it only missed the mark by half a billion dollars which is a very impressive undertaking, considering in the past we've seen blowouts of 5, 10, 20 billion. So to be 500 million within range is virtually on target. So for that, you've got to give them a heck of a lot of credit. And I must say, they didn't gloat about that. No one came out and said, hey, look what we've done, we're superstars. They just said, hey, we're going to keep doing it, which was a good thing. Now, well, the one thing that did happen is revenue did fall short. It was expected to be 411 million. It came in at 406, which is still a phenomenal result. And again, once, once again, remind you if you're here last year, I, I said that last year's growth expectation for revenue was too optimistic. You know, it was. 
But at least they had the sense to turn around and say, okay, we didn't make that $5 billion extra revenue and they reduced their cost by $5 billion, and that's how they managed to come in on track with that budget very close to, you know, the actual very close to the budget. So hats off for that. Good kudos. Now, next year they've forecast once again a very generous expansion of revenue up by 6.8%. But where last year I was a little bit sceptical because there was no real significant revenue measures, this year there are a lot of revenue measures in this budget. So it is probably more likely than ever that they may come close to achieving that 6.8% revenue growth. So that's probably, for the first time, I'm going to say plausible, where the past I've been very sceptical. You know, expenses are going to rise to 459. So next year we're going to have a deficit you know, of $29 billion, which is huge, huge. It's going to drop the year after the 21, and then drastically fall down to $2.5 billion before returning the surplus of $7.4 billion in 2021. So in four years' time, we should be moving towards a surplus. Now, again, I'll believe it when I see it. I think we're a long way from that. But it is genuinely within sights for the first time in a long time. And I think they can do that, particularly because they've learnt the power of negotiating bills through the Senate, so that's a good thing. GDP sat at 1.75, expected to be 2.25, so even with a softer economy, they managed to get the revenue and, the, and the, the numbers that they wanted. Unemployment was a tick higher, so that did hurt them a little bit. And CPI sat at 2%, thanks largely to soft commodities and also low interest rates. So. That's probably not going to be the same environment we're looking forward to in the future, but they're still expecting CPI to keep low. So overall, next year, I think it's a very plausible target of 29.4 deficit. Still an enormously massive deficit. Enormously massive, but we're at least theoretically on the right track, so it's a good thing. So big, big credit to them for coming in so close to target there. First time in a long time, so you've got to give them a bit of you know, you know, kudos. Now, this year's budget, there's lots in it, so strap in, let's go. In infrastructure is the big push. They're, they're going to be committing $75 billion over the next 10 years into infrastructure. Now, they're unashamedly borrowing for this, and they've created a, def a, a, a line in the sand of good debt, bad debt. They don't mind borrowing for infrastructure, and that is a sensible government strategy. Where we've always been in the past, we've been borrowing to just pick up the shortfall. But as long as we're buying something with that debt that has value and will create value, it's not a bad idea to borrow because interest rates are cheap. So they are taking the right approach in doing this. There's lots going on, including the Snowy Project. You know, they're going to expand that significantly. Now, it might be a little bit optimistic, but they're going for it, and they're going for it in a big way. And the first challenge they've got is to buy the Snowy River Project back off the state governments of New South Wales and Victoria. Where that will become challenging is trying to agree a price. Now, all these governments, they all value their assets very highly, so to get them to agree to a price is going to be a very, very interesting little thing to watch from the sidelines. But they're willing to be generous, and we'll see how it goes. There's 10 billion going in rail. So we're going to go crazy on rail in Australia. You know, we're going to have, in Victoria, you know, a, a link for the first time to the airport. I mean, the airport's miles out. And the traffic's getting worse and worse, so eventually we'll get a railway there. There's going to be improved you know, passenger rail. There's also going to be a line that goes from Melbourne to Brisbane. So it's an inland rail. I think it's going to bypass Sydney, unfortunately. I don't know what Sydney did wrong. But uh, you know, that's going to be a huge project. Now, maybe it's a little bit too yesterday. I'm not sure. Maybe, hopefully it'll be a fast rail. I'm not sure what it's going to be, but it's going to be a nice concept. There's $5 billion over the next few years going to do the second airport at Badgerys Creek. Now, this has been on the cards for as long as I can remember. This must be like a 20-year evaluation process. But it's finally come to life and it's meant to be happening literally start sometime in the next three years. But interestingly, the airports, the current airport's owner or operator in Sydney has looked at it and said, no, we're not interested, we don't want to get involved in that one. So they've got to find someone to do it and run it. That's going to be a big challenge. And you know, I'm not sure whether it's as necessary as they all talk about, but it's certainly going to come and it's going to be a big, big project. In Perth, my hometown, $1.2 billion is going to go into the Metronet you know, uh, rail complex. Queensland's getting $800 million to improve the Bruce Highway and, and connections up at Caloundra. And there's an additional $472 million going out to regional projects all around Australia to just strengthen that up. 
They're also setting up the new Regional Investment Corporation to, f to manage the, the big announcement of last year, which was a $4 billion loans pack, uh, package into water resources and into farm businesses. So the Regional Investment Corp is being set up to manage the distribution of that $4 billion worth of funding, which will be a big winner. Health, well, that's a, a big one at the moment. I think on the table there is my friend Mr Shorten, the, the opposition leader. He's about to get a health check to see if he's got the very dangerous Mediscare virus. It's hidden somewhere, apparently. And the big budget item this year was to destroy the Mediscare virus. You might recall, if you were following us around politics, that just before the election, they came out and said, hey, Liberals are going to get rid of Medicare. You'll be lost and all that out, out alone. And it get, got a lot of momentum. So the government's very cunningly, from a political sense, said, hey, let's take away the rumours. We said we weren't going to get rid of it. No one believes us. So they very cunningly separated Medicare from general revenue. So from now, all the Medicare um, levies that are collected, less the NDIS contribution, will be put into a separate bank account guaranteed for life to go to fund health. And that basically takes the Medicare debate off the table. So very, very sneaky and very, very smart. So separating that from general revenue is just going to identify it. They've also gone back and fixed up the unpopular decisions, which were to freeze some co-payments and the rest, so they're you know, making it a little bit more money back for everybody. And they're also throwing another $2.8 billion into hospital funding across Australia. So they're making a very concerted effort to show, hey, no, no, we're really into health. We're really into health. There's $1.2 billion being spent to add new medicines onto the approved list to be subsidised and fix up the oldies. There's $165 million going into mental health all over the place, including veterans, etc. There's $15 million being, uh, going towards the Commonwealth Games to get our elite athletes even more elite. And then the big announcement of the budget was a 0.5% increase in the Medicare levy to fund the NDIS. Now, a lot of people are referring this to, to this as, as a tax increase. Well, it probably technically is, but the NDIS is a bipartisan thing. Both parties and all parties in Australia have agreed of the importance of having a super-duper disability scheme to, for everyone in Australia. It's a phenomenal sized thing. It's beyond all comprehension, and it was going to have a huge shortfall. The shortfall was going to be about $4 billion a year, rising up to $8 billion a year. So the government said, look, we don't want to pay that, so why don't we just tap on an extra half percent? And that picks up that difference. And it throws everything back into the fairness of sharing it amongst the entire country. And it's also a tough one, because if you want to stand up and complain about it, you don't look too good. You don't look too good in Australia if you're not going to help out someone who's not good, as fortunate as you are. So good luck whinging about that rise. That ain't going to happen. So they've been very, very smart in that regard. And I think that was also a large bargaining chip in getting it through other legislation. But I am genuinely concerned about the size of NDIS. You know, it is an $11 billion cost to the country each year, rising over a decade to $18 billion a year. It's massive. In Australia at the moment, there's 800,000 plus people on disability, on disability pensions. It's an enormous amount. And they'll all be entitled to some level of support through the NDIS. It's a huge cost. If anything going wrong with me, I'm going straight back to Australia, I can tell you that much. It's a great social system. It's just my concern is how much will it be abused. Now, the government has thrown a few hundred million dollars into setting up an integrity commission to be able to monitor what's going on and ensure there's fairness in the delivery and the costing and everything, which is quite sensible. So hopefully, fingers crossed, everything goes swimmingly. But as we all know, there's a good propensity of governments to not do it all that efficiently, but I'm hoping that it, they do. Now, the banks have been allegedly the big loser of the budget. Six billion dollars has been stripped from the banks through this new nasty little levy. But it's small potatoes to the banks. Believe me, six billion is nothing. It's over four years, you know, and the banks make huge profits. Now, if you feel sorry for them and if you're objectionable, just a reminder that the banks have managed to keep 0.25% of reductions declared by the Reserve Bank of Australia that they didn't pass on to their borrowers. Every time the Reserve Bank said, oh, look, it's 0.25 down, they said, oh, we can only do 0.2 of that. We can't do it all. Too expensive. 
And everyone's forgotten about that. Just today, St. George sent out a letter to all of our clients saying, oh, if you're a foreigner, we're charging you an extra 1% on your loan. Believe you me, the size of our loan book will probably pay St. George's whole levy because they're going to get 1%, and this is 0.06%, not of their loan book, but of their debt support liability. It's not very much in the scheme of the banks, but they're going to scream, they're going to holler, I ain't listening. They've received too much benefit and they've had the privilege over the last short while to have their investor lending increase in revenue. They've been lifting interest rates up significantly without a single dollar of increase in cost. So they've already got this st money stashed in the closet. Don't you worry about that. It's coming good. They're allegedly not allowed to pass it on, which is probably why they've been lucky to be passing it on when it wasn't there over the last couple of months. Maybe that's pure coincidence. I wouldn't want to be sceptical. They've got a new watchdog that's going to look over them because apparently the, the watchdogs that are there aren't doing enough job. And believe me, there's three or four watchdogs. So I don't know what another one is going to make any difference for, but it'll apparently expedite things, which is always wonderful. And they're going to hold them more accountable. If they do naughty things in the banks, even at executive level, they're going to be fined significantly significantly, up to $200 million. And allegedly, there's senior executives are going to have their bonuses deferred. They're not going to be allowed to collect them for four years just in case they get found out to do something bad. Now, maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. But what I don't understand is why would the government want to do that? In Australia, if you're one of those bank executives that gets those bonuses, there's a good chance you're on a 47% tax rate. So if they defer the bonus for the executive, guess what? They defer the tax collection too. So I don't get the point of that. You might as well pay it to them, get the 47% off them, and who cares? But that's just how it goes. And uh, the aim of all of this is to increase competition. That levy will only be paid by the five biggest banks, the four majors and Macquarie. And so all the little banks are supposedly going to dance around the fire with joy and say, oh, we can be more competitive. I don't see that happening. The main reason is all the little banks got eaten by the big banks a long time ago. The time to have fixed this was five years ago when St George took over, oh sorry, when Westpac took over St George, when Commonwealth Bank took over Bank West, the two stars that were coming up through the little bank ranks and the governments of the day allowed them to do those takeovers, which was a disgrace. A disgrace and it's too hard now to catch up but at least they're gonna try at least they're gonna try all right okay education now the libs get a hammering for not being nice with education but they're throwing 18.6 billion extra dollars at schools over the next 10 years to say see we care and the Gonski report which they've never really been fans of they've now embraced I don't even know what the Gonski report is, but I know it's, I know it's big. So they're going to do it now. So apparently that'll keep everybody happy. And that's, again, that's the grease to get everything through the Senate. Adoption of things that they really didn't find palatable not that long ago. But now all of a sudden it's, hey, we love this stuff. Get us through the Senate. You can have it. And that's what's going on. Smart politics at last. There's allegedly a modest increase to university fees. Modest to everybody except the student, of course. So we're going to see a fair bit of rise for that, which is a bit sad. And, uh, you know, the government's saying, hey, but don't worry, we're still covering half. But the other half is still expensive. Don't worry about that. And one of the things that could be controversial, and, you know, I'm waiting to see the legislation to be sure, but it looks like if you're only PR, not citizen, you will not get government support. You'll be on foreign student fees. So you need to be very mindful. We'll have to obviously check that as the formal legislation comes through because that could have a big cost impact if you haven't gone to the, the process of going through your citizenship yet. The downside is, you know, they're, they're putting the fees up. The good side is apparently they're letting you borrow that. But probably one of the baddest things in this budget for me from an educational perspective is they're now going to make the students pay it back earlier. You know, it used to be that you didn't have to start paying back your university fees until $55,000 worth of income. That's going to be reduced down to 42, so it's going to kick in a lot earlier. Now, of course, allegedly that's a good thing. It recycles it, puts it back in for the next person to use, but it does put a fair bit of pressure on. 
at a very early you know, line. So I'm not as big a fan of that. I do believe in the fact that government should pay for as much of the university cost as possible because it does go back in the economy. But I suppose if everyone just leaves and goes overseas and works as an expat, that's not a good thing. So they have to have a balance. And of course now the rules do make expats pay back their hex debt you know, on their foreign income amount. So that's an interesting one too. I don't think there's too many expats that aren't earning 42,000 bucks. So that's going to be interesting. And the, if the universities do the right thing by everyone, there's a 2.5% efficiency dividend and they'll be clamouring for that. You can mark my words on that. In terms of tax changes, quite a bit going on. The small business write-off has been extended. That's the $20,000 instant write-off if you buy any equipment. And, and now it's for any business with turnover less than $10 million. So it's a great thing. It's a super program. Hopefully it'll be renewed every year. Would have been good if they had done a two or three year commitment. But it is quite expensive to the government, but it's a fantastic economic stimulus. This is real progressive money into the economy. You know, the going after the multinationals, they've been doing that for a while now. Last year they raised 2.7 billion chasing the Googles and all those dudes, right? Now the thing is they've issued the invoices for 2.7 billion, but that just means we're about to begin the legal battles. So they know that they're due that money, but good luck getting it. I think they've got all the legal team ready to go there. It's going to be very interesting to watch that. They're throwing some money after organised crime in the black economy, you know, just to make things better all the time. And one of the interesting things is they don't trust property developers anymore. Who would have thought? Property developers have to charge GST when they sell you a property. You don't see it when you're a buyer because it's inclusive. It's not at an additional cost. It's inclusive in the price. And then they're meant to collect the money. A couple of months later, they're meant to send it to the government and it's all fine. But it can be up to one eleventh of the purchase price. About 9%. That's a lot. And the thing is, if they don't get paid, it disappears somewhere. So the government's not going to trust them from July 18. When you pay your money at settlement, your settlement agent will send the tax officer's component direct to the tax office, which I think is a great thing. The numbers are so big now, it's smart. And if you roll your own ciggies in Australia, it's been cheap for a while, but that's going to get expensive because they're now going to tax you as if it's a normal packet cigarette. So that's going up. I don't know how anyone affords to smoke these days. Other things, there's 400 million going into childcare. Childcare is huge in Australia. The amount of money we spend there is mind boggling. So we're spending 400 million not to do anything except train more people. That's how big it is. It's the biggest industry. There's been all sorts of ruckus going in Australia. They've been finding childcare centres that have been collecting millions of dollars and they've just found out they never actually had any kids. Who would have thought? You know, oh, we didn't realise we actually had to look after the kids. They just put them on the list. So hopefully they're going to spend some of that money to make sure that the kids actually turn up. That would be really good. And then Defence has got an early Christmas present. They were meant to go to 2% 2, 2 GDP spending in three years' time. That's been accelerated back to now. So there's a lot of money going to go into the military, as also with the Federal Police. They've just been given a $500 million injection and they've just got a whole bunch of new toys. So, you know, hopefully it'll keep Australia a bit safer. Welfare has been tightened up significantly. They're bringing in a new three-strike policy. If you miss interviews, if you misbehave, if you don't go to training, if you do something that is beyond your, your um, promises, then you will be fined based on your weekly payments. The first time you don't do it, half of your fortnightly payment will disappear. The second time you don't do it, a whole fortnightly payment will disappear. The third time you lose a month worth of payments. So that's pretty good. For anyone that's been found to not make their appointment because they're a little bit too drunk or a little bit too happy, they're going to get penalised too. They're going to move on to a cashless card. So they won't be able to get cash anymore. They'll only be able to buy groceries with a smart card. And to, to be honest with you, I think that's how it should be across the board. So hopefully this is the first steps towards that sometime soon. But we'll see what goes down there. I've done mention that. The skilled migrants, they took away the 457 visa. Again, it's a bit of a political hot potato. It's not a real problem, but they certainly were making it out as though. And what they have done is replaced it with a, a temporary skill shortage visa. Under the old um, 457, they used to have to spend money on training, but no one was really doing that. So they've taken that out, and what they've done is replaced it with a levy that starts at about $1,300 for a small business, $1,800 for a bigger business, up to about $3,000 per employee. 
You were meant to have spent that on training, but no one can prove that they did. So they said, look, we're not going to trust you anymore. Just give it to us and we'll do it. So that money is going to go off towards apprenticeships and local jobs, which is a good thing. So happy to see that. And for the first time in a long time, housing is the focus of this budget. Now, who would have thought that that would be necessary? Australia is so cheap. Not. Not if you come from New South Wales. Not if you come from Victoria anymore. Still affordable. But we've got a crisis in Australia. It's not an affordability crisis. It's an affordability of choice crisis. Australians want far more than they can afford, and they're angry that they're not being given that. I'm a bit like that in Singapore. I'd like someone to give me one of those Sentosa houses for around about $2 million. Why are they 20 That's not fair. They're nice. I like that. But this is the modern age. If you want it, go work for it, like the rest of us have to. And yes, you run, run really hard, and when you get there, they've moved the post down the, the, the uh, path a bit more, and you've got to run a bit harder. That's how it's always been. But they want to make sure everyone's okay. Now, the only way to fix a housing crisis is supply. You can tinker around the edges, you can you know, use interest rates, you can do all sorts of things, but if you don't produce more houses and there's more people, the crisis persists. Hence, if you look at a place called Sydney and a little place called Melbourne, that's why they're having record growth. Their normal growth cycle is in play, but it's been expanded, elongated and accelerated because of high population growth with limited new supply. And that's a good thing if you already own. It's terrible if you don't. So they're finally going to say, hey, let's release some government land, let's work with the states to do some things, and they're going to get out there and release thousands of homes all around the place. First home buyers have got a nice little sweetener, $30,000 that they can now use in a Singapore-style superannuation account. Now, this is not part of your super. You'll have a separate account linked to your super where you can put $15,000 a year under salary sacrifice. Where that's big is that it means that it's pre-tax dollars. So you'll only be charged a 15% tax where you might have paid 30 or up to 47% tax as an individual salary. So you'll be able to accumulate a bit more, but it's only $30,000. A friend of mine rang me from Sydney and said, mate, is that a good thing? What do you reckon? I said, it's great if you're from anywhere but Sydney. $30,000 isn't going to do too much in Sydney. If you're a couple, it's 60, so it's getting closer, but it's still a struggle. But it's better than nothing. Now, there have been a lot of conjecture as to why not let people use their super. And this is, the, again, the little bit of the door opening. Singaporeans have benefited from CPF being able for the housing for decades, it hasn't hurt too much here. But prices are very high, but at least you can afford it because you've got your CPF and stuff. But this is an opening of the door and it could lead anywhere, which I think is a good thing. They're also trying to encourage you know, retirees and older people to sell up their big flash houses and go move somewhere small by letting you put in a bit extra out of your sale proceeds into the super. Last year they capped the amount you could have in your super by what, to $1.6 million in retirement to get full tax concessions. This 300,000 will allow you to go to 1.9. So it is a, quite a big inducement if you are you know, thinking about why have I got this big expensive house, you know, maybe I might get out of it. So it's a carrot. It's a carrot that's, again, at least something. And of course, negative gearing, that means saying get rid of it, get rid of it. It's staying. It's going nowhere under the Liberals. And even the Labor Party, they're going to keep it to some extent. They're going to limit it to new properties. But if you're worried about what the Labor Party might do, buy now. Because they've already said that if anyone's got it at the time and they change it, it'll continue on. So if you have some level of speculation, buy sooner. But negative gearing is a sensible and prudent instrument. And a lot of people forget that our market in Australia is still only 30% investors. It's 70% owner-occupy, one of the highest in the world. So we need that supplementary 30% for the rental pool. So it's a good thing. What is happening is they're taking away some bad measures. And these are things that we don't do at ATS, and I've been worried about it for a while, because this depreciation transfer has been an issue. Currently, when you buy a house, you can claim all the carpets and everything in the house. And what a lot of people have been doing is going to a quantity surveyor and saying, hey, give me a report that I can use for my tax. 
And the quantum surveyor is restarting it. The guy that you bought it off has already expunged all of the depreciation allowances, but they're giving it to you again and claiming it for the second and third time. The system was never meant to do that. And so the government's just said, look, we're just calling it quits on this. This is no good. You had a chance to do it right, you didn't. We're taking it away. It's bad for the people like us that do it right, but I can understand their motivation. What it means is don't buy a house that's just had the, the kitchen renovated. Buy it and renovate the kitchen yourself. Buy it a bit cheaper. See how we go. They've also taken away our beloved travel claims. God, I almost made a reputation on that stuff. So I'm very disappointed to see that go, but it has gone. So we can't get that for the locals and we can't get that for overseas, unfortunately. And they're going for a big push towards affordable housing. Now, I like the concept of this, but I hate the fact that it's sort of pushed towards affordable rental housing. It's not affordable acquisition housing, it's rental housing. So they're going and trying to increase a lot of supply in the rental market, which will take pressure off, but it won't solve the problem of eventual ownership. So there's a bit of a concern in my mind for that. But what they are doing is encouraging investors to buy it and give them a 60% capital gains tax discount instead of the current 50. They're getting managed investment trusts to go into it and letting them get that discount too and just relaxing the rules. And they're trying to fund more funding into affordable housing at the state government level and get the relaxing and release. Now this may increase the, the rental pool, that's fabulous, but I'm not a big fan. Now the definition of affordable housing in Australia, you have to be formally ticked off as that. You can't just say, oh, I've got an affordable house, give me the money. You have to have registered and you basically have to give someone your property at 80% of the market rental. And they have to be in a socio-economic group that meets that criteria and you register your home. Personally, I'm not a fan of that. You know, I don't want to rent my house out for a minimum of 10 years with a 20% discount to rental. If you do, that's great, but it's not my sort of thing. But it's going to be someone's sort of thing. So it could help the situation but we'll see what goes down. In terms of us in the overseas here, you know, well, those travel claims disappear for us as well. So, you know, and again, if you look at it, it's sad because the government has said the reason they've taken this out is because of abuse. Not because of the lack of validity, it's because of abuse. People have been pushing it too far. Again, we've always claimed it pro rata, you know, what's the reason for you going? How many days work? How many days, you know, rental? We've always done the right thing because that's what you should do. But some people just push the envelope too far and have been claiming too much and not you know, offsetting. And that's why they've said, you know what, too hard, let's just change it. I can't blame them, it's just disappointing. It's a, it's, you know, to some extent it is a, a bonus, but it is still something that we deserve. And it's technically legally allowed as a deduction, but it's now being removed. One of the big changes from the budget is they're removing the uh, principal residence exemption for foreign and temporary residents. Now, the only problem with the, the budget is it's not really clear what this means. There's foreigner expat. I can't give you a definitive answer on that, but this was a similar situation when they removed the 50% discount back in 2012. It looked like it would only be for non-Australian citizens but they brought it in for everybody. So expats and foreigners alike lost the 50% discount, so it could be the same. Now, the only reason this would impact us is we do have a six-year extension of the principal residence when you move out and you rent it out. You get it tax-free for six years, so this may or may not impact that. The last change didn't take over from any existing change, so this may not either, but we'll have to wait and see. And the only other time is that the, the principal residence exemption is allowed to go on indefinitely if you don't rent your house out. So if you weren't renting your house out, you'll now lose it. And it's going to close off in June 2019. It will be grandfathered. So, you know, if you've got one now and you've got that couple of years left, that's okay. The main people this is going to affect is the likes of students, okay? If you're, and, and also retirees. If you're on a student or a retiree visa, that is a temporary visa. And you were allowed to buy one established property and use it as your home. And if you finish your visa, if you cancel it and go back to where you came from, you're required to sell the house and it was tax free because that's the house you were living in. One of the conditions is you're not allowed to rent it. But that's now going to be removed. So even if you go down as a student, buy the house, when you sell in a few years time, 
it's going to have capital gains tax impact. So that's not so good, but that's just how it goes, unfortunately. Withholding tax was brought in about a year or so ago, and it's 10% if the house price was over $2 million. Now, it's not an additional tax. It's a provision to make sure you pay your tax. They keep 10% back if it was over $2 million. You lodge your tax return. If the actual tax is less than 10%, you get the difference back. If it's more than 10%, you pay more. They're lifting it from 10 to 12 and a half, but more importantly, they're dropping the threshold from 2 million to 750. So where it didn't impact that many people at 2 million, it's now gonna virtually mean all of us are impacted. Now in Australia, they did it the difficult way. They said anyone who's not a resident has to apply for an exemption certificate, otherwise the money comes out. So we don't have to do anything about this. Just if you sell your house, your settlement agent or your lawyer will automatically deduct 12%, 12.5% of, of your sale price and send it to the government. Now, if you think that is too much, we can apply for a variation to what we think the tax would be. So that'll keep us busy. Anytime you sell a property, ring us first. We'll calculate it and then we can put a variation if necessary. And there's a new tax federally that if you leave your property vacant for more than six months as a foreigner, and importantly, it's a new foreigner, a new foreign buyer, not anyone who owns a property at the moment, but if you buy a property from today on and you leave it empty for more than six months in the year, there will be a $5,000 fine or, or charge. So that's not going to be too welcome on top of your other holding costs, etc. So the, the willingness to leave it empty will be diminished. And that's what they're trying to do is encourage everyone to put their property into the rental pool and make sure that the pressure is, is relieved. So that's going to be an interesting one. But my favourite one of this budget is they've returned the 50% maximum sale quota on the FIOB for new developments. And I can tell you very proudly, this is because of us. Because we are literally the sole voice that has been begging for this for the last four years. So I think after banging my head against the government things, I finally listen. The reason why this is so important is that's why we've had an explosion by removing that 50% threshold, which was there up until 2009. That let all these foreign developers come in design projects for foreigners and sell them to their clients overseas. And that's why we've had this influx of massive amounts of Chinese buyers, because they're the guys who have the customers. The Australian companies were not selling 100% overseas. They were selling at best 20s and 30s. The foreign companies were selling 90%. And most of it is too small, because it's Shanghai style, Hong Kong style. Wasn't wanted in Australia, and we're stuck with all these bad buildings. So this coming back in will be a fantastic thing to cool the market more than every other measure. Because now, if you want to sell that project, you need to design it for the local market because 50% of it has to be sold for the local market. And hopefully that'll make the price more realistic because they'll need to sell them to get their things going and might release their profits. So I'm over the moon that this is back. You know, the downside is economically, it will slow down, obviously, the foreign activity. But that's a price that I think we should be willing to pay. So thank God that Smats has been nagging for that. We got it. Just to show you the volume, last year the foreign sales were $70 billion in Australia. $70 billion. And of course, Victoria leading the way with its skyscraper mentality going on there. You know, we call them stops, small, tall and overpriced. We've been begging you not to buy them. So if you haven't bought them, you're very lucky because the price there is not looking good. And just to show you now the impact on foreign investors, you know, the changes are not too good from the, the budget and, and they keep slugging us. They brought in the foreign investor fee, which we also were a large contributor. We were probably the ones that instigated that. We call that the SMATS tax. That's $5,500 now, up from 5000 And that's if you buy a property as a foreign, not Australian PR, not Australian citizen, you know, foreign national. You know, there's 5500 under a million plus, you know, 11000 if it's over a million and 11000 per additional million. But what has happened is the stamp duty has changed, particularly in Victoria. Victoria used to have stamp duty concessions if you bought off the plan prior to commencement. That has now been removed for investors, foreign and local. Okay, so if you're thinking about doing anything in Victoria, you want to do it before the 30th of June because that's when that kicks in. So if you've been thinking about buying a property in Victoria, come and see us, get it sorted before the 30th of June. Otherwise, you'll end up losing that stamp duty concession, which is worth up to about 5% of the purchase price. 
Now, Victoria have also snuck in the foreign buyer's fee. They've got now 7%. It was 4 They were the first state that brought in a foreign buyer's fee. It was 4%. And again, at the time, that wasn't a big deal because they didn't have a huge stamp duty cost because you got the off-plan concession. But now that's gone. You're going to pay what was 4 which is now 7 plus up to 6% stamp duty. So you've now got a 13% state-imposed cost when you buy in Victoria. That's pretty significant. At a time when foreigners are struggling to get loans and are now paying higher loan fees and et cetera, that's pretty tough. Now, New South Wales brought in a foreign buyer fee of 4%, and I can quote you that they said, oh, we're going to do it because Victoria did it and it didn't seem to matter. So we'll do it too. And then Queensland brought it in in October 16 at 3%. WA doesn't have it yet, but the Labor Party just won the election just recently and it platformed with a policy saying, we're going to charge foreign buyers and put the money towards schools and hospitals. So that's coming very soon to a suburb near Perth, okay? So if you want to buy something in Perth before it happens, it's the best time to do it. Come and see us. We've got some great stuff down there. But, uh, you know, 21st of June, you know, July 15, all these things are changing now. You can see those foreigners are just easy targets and they've been held you know, uh, captive. At the same time, you're stuck now that you've bought, so they're also sneaking up the land tax, which is a state-imposed tax. Nothing to do with this budget, but it affects us as foreign property owners. New South Wales is charging an extra 0.75% if you're not PR or Australian citizen. Now, Victoria have gone even bigger... This is the new Victorian land tax rule. So you can see resident rates, if you've got a property worth 250,000 land value, now that's not necessarily your property value, it's the unimproved land value, you know, and that's what you're charged at. And it's 275 bucks if the land's 250. So that would be a $500,000 apartment, for example. But now, if you're an absentee, i.e. a foreigner, 250,000 is not 275, it's $4,000. And that's for a small little apartment. That's a fair chunk of your rent now going. And you've been owning there for a while and they've just gone bang. Thanks for being in Victoria. It's the world's most livable city and we're going to make sure it stays that way with your money. Simple as that. You can see at modest gains, it's up to $70,000 there if it hits $3 million. Now that's obviously a big house, but $70,000 is a big land tax fee. It's massive. And again, it's too late if you've already bought. This is not for future acquisitions, it's there. So you need to be very mindful. Importantly, it does not apply to Australian citizens or permanent residents. But what we're seeing is that they're sending out bills to PRs and, and citizens because you've got an overseas address. They're assuming that you are an absentee. And most people think, oh, I live overseas, I must be an absentee. So if you do have land in Victoria and you are a PR or a citizen, ring us up, we need to go and change that you know, assessment notice, and you'll save yourself a fortune, as you can see. I think I've got one going from $15,000 down to what will be like 400. It's a huge amount, so don't, don't hold back. And the Victoria is also bringing in a vacancy tax. So the federal government's brought in a $5,000 charge, but Victoria's going to charge you 1% of your capital improved value. So what basically the property is worth. Slightly conservative to market, but somewhere around that mark. So if you're in Victoria and you want to keep your property empty, it's going to cost you a fortune. You're best to rent it out and put the savings to a penthouse at the Hyatt. Go down and live the life of luxury for a month, it'll be cheaper. So do that. Now it does exclude holiday homes, but not holiday homes if you're living overseas. Only a holiday home if you've got another home in Victoria. You know, work pads, which will be a bit harder to define, and if you're away for genuine reasons like illness, that doesn't matter too. So you've now got in Victoria two levels, federal and state, if you keep your property vacant. They want it back on the market, and you'll see why in a moment. But there certainly isn't going to be too many people that can afford to leave it empty. I've never been able to, so I don't have to worry about this tax. But you need to be mindful of it. And to show you the quantum, you can see there Victoria, they're not silly. 17,000 sales to Victoria last year for foreigners. 17,000 people potentially going to pay $4,000 or more in land tax. If you work that out, that's about 120 odd million bucks once they all sneak up to that 250,000. In the new tax alone, in the foreign buyer's duty and the stamp duty, 
That's worth about $300 million to the Victorian government. I don't know about you, but I'm not sure what they're doing with it. But I did notice they changed the, the crossover lights. Maybe that's where most of the money went. They've now got women on the little crossover thing. So that's probably where that money's going. Highly important, you know. But, you know, this is the scale, 17,000. You can see the escalation. Now, this is one of the reasons why I'm happy to see that 50% quota come back in FIRB. When all this is being sold to overseas, it's not necessarily stuff that locals would want to buy anyways, but it is putting pressure on the quality sites. So the quality sites that would have built three, 400 nice Australian-sized homes are now being sold to foreigners with 1,500 homes on them that are small, poxy, and not really nice. I'd rather the 300 nice ones get built than the 1,500 bad ones. But the good news is, you can beat the system. There's always a way. There's always a way. And Smats will always bring it to you first. You know that. Marry an Australian. <laughs> get in and get your PR application in. You don't pay these fees if you're a permanent resident. So if you were thinking about moving anyways, get it in now. Get it in before you buy. Spend three or $4,000 on a PR application and then buy the property and you don't get charged the foreign buyer fee of 7%. How's that for rate of return? Come on, I'm taken, but there's a few others out there. <laughs> Let's get you going. Now, the great thing is Australia is still doing okay. It's always doing okay. We've now passed the record as the world's longest-running Western country. We beat Netherlands. Netherlands used to hold the record as the longest-running without a recession. We are now it. I think we're chasing Taiwan now for the world record. And we're going to get there. We're definitely going to get there. You see, GDP kicked up a little bit last year, which is great. But the thing here that I'm worried about is the inflation. It has kicked up. It's been artificially low in my mind. And it's now kicked up to just over 2%. And that, again, is a big indicator for the, the Reserve Bank with interest rates. If it gets up too high, they'll want to sneak interest rates up. Now, they might not need to do that too much because they've been sneaking it up through the investors for a while. But we'll see what happens there. They've got to keep an eye on it. But everything's going pretty groovy in Australia. Hence why it's plausible to see us getting back towards a balanced budget within the next four odd years. Now, here's interest rates. They look pretty fab. On the face of it, look, the cash rate's still way, way cheap at about one and a half. And the lending rates, hold on, they've been going up even though the other one's flat. They've been sneaking up a little bit. That's what the banks are going to do. That's how they're going to pay for that 0.06%, which isn't on their whole loan book. It's only on their debt support for the loan book. Negligible when you're as big as they are. But the number sounds bad, but that's what they've done. Now, the problem is the reason my mates there got some handcuffs on is because particularly if you're overseas, it's really hard to change your loan. Today, when St. George sent the thing out saying, hey, we're putting your rate up 1%, have a good day. Well, if you ring up and say, hey, that's terrible, give me a new loan, we say, we can't. It's really hard. So you're stuck. And they know you're stuck. And it's bad that they're abusing that privilege. It's a disgrace in my mind. So I would have liked the government to have put some you know, integrity measures in there, saying don't abuse existing customers. New ones, that's not so bad. But, you know, the ones that are already there, leave them alone. But no, they're going for it. To give you an idea, this is to tease you, the interest rates. If you were living in Australia, or you're a PR or citizen, that's what you'd get. Owner-occupied, look at that, 3.79. Overseas now as an investor, 4.58. So they've put 0.8% premium now on investor, and they used to be the same. I know they're the same because it was Smats that made that happen. When we first came to Singapore, we lobbied the bank so much, saying, why are you charging him more than that? He's a better customer. So they gave us that equality, and it became the norm across Australia, but not in the last year. So that 0.8, that's on 30% of their book. I'm telling you, that's going to easily pay that levy. Don't worry about that. Keep buying those bank shares. But you can see the P&I there and the interest only, they've changed that mix too. 
You're paying a premium if you're not reducing your loan. But that's the fear factor that you don't know what you're doing. So it's a changing world in Australia. But that's the, if you're a perfect client and you qualify under the new onerous conditions, which believe you me, not many people do. This is the real life for people living overseas. Very much less choice than they used to be in lenders. And the banks are very difficult. I mean, where you could get an easy, you know, multiple loan before, it's probably 40, 50, 60 percent as much borrowing capacity you've got today than it was 12 months ago. So when you've been saving your deposit, you go, hey, I'm ready to buy that house. Well, it's going to have to be half that house, not the whole house. That's not a good thing. And if you're an overseas person, it's even tougher again. Most of the big banks now will not lend to foreigners. So we're back on the second tier lending, and that's pushing the cost up significantly. We saved from 4.2% there for foreigners on the interest rate, but the truth is that's only if you qualify through the Singapore-based lenders, which is very, very hard to do under the new lending rules. The Australian second tier lenders are charging 7 8%. They're gouging like crazy. We're trying to remedy that as much as we can. But it's tough, but it's possible. But you need us. We're trying to set up our own bank, as you know, and that's not as an easy thing. I thought it would be simple. Who'd have thought setting up a bank would be hard? Bankers do it. I didn't know why it would be that tough. But we have got things going. We've had all the commitments thing. We lodged the application 1st of December last year. And I'm just sitting patiently waiting to hear anything. But apparently it takes a long time. Well, we're looking at some plan B options, including mortgage funds and all sorts of things. So we'll be able to give you some prime interest rates to lend to nice people at reasonable interest rates. So we'll keep you posted on things like that as they happen. Looking at the currency, I don't think this the budget is going to impact the currency. Against the US dollar, I don't think it would matter what Australia does. I think it's all about Twitter now, isn't it? The US dollars run from the tweet of the twit. And we just don't know what's going to happen on a day-by-day -day basis. It's just incredible there. Now, I'm on record and maintain my stance that the dollar should stay on the, against the US Australian at 75 to 80 cents. And I believe that wholeheartedly. I'm not a currency expert, so please don't take my advice on this. I believe that for one key reason. On the horizon is Trump's intended tax cuts for corporations. Now, normally, I, as an accountant, I would love a tax cut for a corporation. Of course I would. But the problem is that used to work in the old day because if you cut taxes, they'd go and hire people, they'd invest, they'd open up new businesses, they'd open up new services and branches, the money would be rotated. But that's the old days. That doesn't happen anymore. These days, the corporations will take the tax cut and do what they're doing now, hoard the cash. There is so much money in corporate bank accounts in the world right now, it could pay off every dollar of debt of every government on the planet. It's crazy. So if we drop the tax rate in the US, there probably won't be a single job created. There'll just be more bank account, more money in Google's bank account. Apple will just stash another 10, 15 billion. It won't make a stick of difference. So until we change that thinking and get them investing, and I don't think the tax is enough to do so, I think it's dangerous. And it's especially dangerous to the US when they're in that much deficit. We've got a deficit in Australia. It's, what, 20, uh, 30 billion this year. What's theirs again? I can't remember. Um, oh, only about a trillion. Whew. So if you take away a whole chunk of your revenue, they want to go from 25 to 15% corporate tax rate. That's going to make a big difference. And if you can't replace that revenue, which I'm not convinced they can, You've got bigger issues at foot, but I'm not sure. But if that happens, anything could go wrong. I'm still going to hold my 75 to 80 cents. Obviously, we're seeing a little bit of extra instability in the world right now, so it's not surprising the US has strengthened a little bit because when people get nervous, they strengthen that. But I don't think there's any justification. Singapore has followed the trend. So Singapore was up there at about $1.09 there for a while this year. And I'm a believer of $1.05 to $1.10 being the natural range at the moment. We're now just gone underneath that. Not a bad time to send Singapore dollars or US dollars to Australia if you want to. And if you're going to do that, of course, SmatsFX is the best way to do it. It's the cheapest. You get the VIP margin. You can't go wrong. But uh, I think we're about natural range. But it's going to be a very interesting three to six months, you know, economically in the US, politically in the region, and with, you know, people dropping, was it the MOAG? 
Obviously, they had to refill that order. But why would you drop the Moag? What's that about? I don't know. In terms of Australia, why it still kicks on, I've been warning people about this for 20 years. Buy Australia before the rest of the world figures it out. And that's what's happened. The rest of the world figured it out. Not only do we have all those foreigners come in, but they keep, you know, staying. And the, for the first time in the last couple of years, the population growth is now back on the rise. So if you think we've got problems now, wait till that gets back to where it was. The issue in Sydney and Melbourne isn't about, you know, investors pushing prices up or speculators or the Chinese. It's about the fact that 109,000 people moved to New South Wales and they built hardly any decent properties worth living in. It's about Victoria, the world's most livable city, Melbourne, having 127,000 more people and no decent sized accommodation. Lots of apartments being built, but not ones that I can live in with my family. So I've got to go fight like a dog for the nice one against 300 other people at auction. What do you reckon the chances are of success doing that? You'd want to be a seller. But you can see it's kicked back up from 1.3 to 1.5. We've now got 24 million people in Australia. It's overcrowded. Not. There's room for you. Find that Australian, marry them, get your PR, join us. It's nice. The Australian property cycle, well, it's pretty much where it was last time. I, oops, I still think that Sydney is past its peak, but the information lags a little bit. It'll take a little while for everyone to realise that, but I'm pretty sure it's already there. We've already seen a negative growth number come out in the last few months on one of the, the stats. Adelaide just ambles on. Melbourne's going nice because of that 127,000 people rocking up. That's real, genuine pressure. So there's still some more room to move on that. And Perth's coming out of its doldrums. Its population growth collapsed to just 1% last year. That's because people left. But there's still people coming and it's still really nice. So that's going to be doing pretty good. If you have a look at the numbers overall, Australia did 4% in the quarter growth. But that's because it was Christmas. Everybody went crazy. Particularly Sydney. It was probably the last hurrah. These are the last numbers out. We'll get the March ones fairly soon. But, you know, that was pretty much, I think, the peak of the Sydney market, that December point. And we'll see in the next six months whether I was right. Melbourne's still got some natural growth. And by the way, Sydney went from what was year-on-year -year growth last year, 16% down to 12. So it's doing terribly. But I'm telling you, the trend is now to soften. Melbourne, 8.76%. That's a really good return and a sustainable growth level. And you'll probably see that kick up to double digit in the next six months. You know, Brisbane at 26 on the year. Perth was down 3%, which means value. And believe you me, you can't buy much in Sydney right now under $800,000. But you can get a lot there. If you're going to be buying in Sydney, you need to buy really good. Big size, great location, and the best value you can find. It's tough. It's doable. Because it's still 107,000 people turning up. But, you know, if you've only got a limited budget, you'll be needing to look in Queensland, needing to look in Perth, and there's some opportunity up there. Adelaide's just kicking on, and look at Hobart. That's the spot. If only I knew where it was. <laughs> I'm going to have to go home and check it on Google or something. But the thing is, the truth is the fundamentals are still super strong, still super strong. You know, there's Sydney. I'm not worried about imminent collapse. It's not going to happen because look at the vacancy rate. It's 1.9%. It's come off 0.3 in the year. So it's gone from 2.2 to 1.9. Why? We're not building enough and we had 109,000 people turn up. Pretty simple equation. Melbourne, it's come off 0.7%. Even though they're releasing a lot of these big towers, they're sucking that stock up because... It's cool to live in the city, it's just how long can you live in it in that size. And Brisbane, it's now going in the right direction. And even Perth has turned the corner and is now in this quarter starting to suck up some of that excess stock. So it's all looking pretty good there around Australia. Everywhere is where it should be. And finishing off, you'll be glad to know we're almost done. There's lots in this budget. I hope I've given you a good insight into all the key elements, but I could have gone on for another half hour, believe you me, there was so much there. But the things that I really liked about this budget were the highlights was finally housing got some attention. Not sure if it's 100% the right attention, but at least it's some attention. It's been ignored for too long and that's incredible. 
You know, I'm glad the negative gearing remains. It's a false argument that is being put out in Australia that it's bad. It's not bad. You know, it's sensible. As long as you buy something that is worth buying to appreciate, it's a smart decision to a negative gear into anything, shares, property or anything. The government is negative gearing into infrastructure. That's what negative gearing is. Unless you've got the cash, you've got to borrow. You've got to protect the investor. And I'm so wrapped and so proud that we've got that 50% FIB quota back instated. And I'm going to absolutely take the credit for that. And I don't mind how much pain it is for those people back there. It's going to help Australians. It's going to help Australia. It's a good thing. And the door open on super and housing, I think, is good. It's small, but it's a start. You know, the fact that they've come in pretty close to budget, I think that's fantastic. No one's even talked about that. It's like, oh, yeah, that's how it should be. Well, it hasn't been for over a decade, so pretty good job, boys. And we're building a better Australia. It's a more expensive Australia. I hope that all this spending is at least efficient spending, but at least we're doing it. And I'm glad to see the welfare get clamped down. It's an incredible amount of our budget that goes out there. It's phenomenal. So anything they can do to make sure its value is good. Low lights, I'm not chuffed to see affordable housing solely aimed at renters. I don't think we want to build that sort of country. You know, I think Singapore led the world there where they said, no, no rentals, you own. You can buy it, but you can't rent it. I think that would have been far easier. We could have done some of that infrastructure spending in helping people into a home. We could have done government development on those sites. But we'll see what happens down the line. You know, very worried about the threat of removing the expat's six-year rule. We'll see what the legislation comes in as it happens. I'll keep you posted. And I don't like the way that anyone that's not Australian is just being abused. We should be thanking foreigners for keeping the Australian economy afloat. If it hadn't been for the 40,000 foreigners that bought a property in Australia last year, how do you think our economy would have gone? But instead of saying, thanks, you saved my bacon, we say, hey, let's take a piece of his skin and cook it up and see if it tastes like bacon. That's not the way to do it. So we need to start rethinking our attitude there because let's face it, all Australia is is a country full of foreigners. Everyone just got there five minutes ago, but they seem to have forgotten that. So let's wake up to it. I'm very concerned that there's been no issues to address the problems in foreign lending because there is a whole bunch of pipeline loans that need to be written and not enough capital out there to do it. So that's being, I'm working on that on a daily basis, believe me, it takes all my sleep, you know, non-sleep moments. And I don't like the way that they've gone after the banks, so I'm not at all concerned that they did it. But what it does do is it sets a precedent. We've already did it with the mining companies. We generalise and say, let's go for them. How did that work out? Disastrous. So when we start picking winners and say, shoot at them, eventually you shoot everybody. So I don't think it's good to be solely one industry, and so we've got to be careful about that. And I am genuinely concerned as where NDIS will go in terms of cost and control. I love the concept of it. I just want to make sure that they do manage it properly. And I'm quite disappointed about the hex threshold. I really think they shouldn't have done that. I don't think they could have, they could have done that later. It's bad enough you say, hey, it's going to be more expensive, but then to take it back quicker, you know, one punch would have been enough. And I am a bit concerned that although this budget is good and full of, you know, lots of things, there's a lot of broad definitions. And so we're going to have to wait and see a lot of legislation before I can give absolute answers to a lot of things. And they're just, you know, ambiguous, you know, terms too often in this budget. I'd, I'd just like to see a little bit more clarity in the future. All that aside, I still think it's a damn good budget. Apparently the Australians do too. Everyone seems to be okay with it. You know, Labor's complaining because half of it's their, their idea. So they've got no excuse not to pass the legislation. And that's really been the problems of the past budgets. They couldn't get through what they wanted. Labor had that problem. Liberal had that problem. This budget is eminently passable. And that's going to be the big difference between this and all other budgets. So that's why I'm giving it eight and a half. I think it's a pretty good job. On that note, I'm all finished. I thank you very much for coming along. It's great to have you here. And, uh, you know, we'll see how we go and I'll be taking questions as we go. Thank you very much.